Hello, you are very welcome to this Green Week session. Today we are going to be looking at zero pollution and what is needed in the new Horizon Europe. We're going to be talking about this for about the next hour and I do want to encourage it to be incredibly interactive. So please do use the question and answer tool to put your questions to our great panelists. Now we know that there will be a new Horizon Europe and what is going to be in it, but we're going to talk a little bit more about getting towards zero pollution. How do we do it? What are the aims? What are the objectives? Talking quite broadly about what we think should be the next steps. And I've got some great speakers for you today. We have joining us Professor Ruhl Vermeulen from Utrecht University, who is an expert in getting tools for healthy living in urban settings. And also we have joining us from Eurocities Secretary General, Annalisa Boni, and member of the Horizon Europe Cities Mission Board. So we will deal with a lot with that. And in charge of research at the World WHO European Center, we have Dr. Sinea Netanyahu. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me. Let's just start off with kind of getting a feel for where we're all at. Let's talk about very broadly, where do we need to go in terms of getting to zero pollution? What's your take on it? Why do you think it's important that we are talking about this here today on Green Week? Uh, Rul, let me start with you, perhaps. Give me your, set out your stall. Give me your opening thoughts. Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to talk about this uh, important topic. Um, I always like to take a step back and um, really to think about the fact that most of the chronic diseases that we are facing today um, basically have in some way or form a environmental driver. And with that, I mean uh, either chemical or social um, or basically the built environment. And if we really think about how much do we actually know about those drivers, then um, you could basically say the glass is half full or half empty. Um, we know certain things um, like air pollution, noise, um, but even on those uh, topics, there's still much to be done. Uh, but if we look at the evidence that we have um, to date, then based on the Global Burden of Disease Project, um, we would estimate basically that 50% of these um, environmental driven factors of disease are still unknown to us. Uh, and that actually means that we um, don't have really the right tools or the um, action points um, to uh, that we actually can intervene on. Um, and that actually leads to the fact that um, you can raise the question, are we really doing enough to protect the health of European citizens? And um, my argument here would be that um, we really need to start thinking more from a system approach um, to the problem. And that is that we cannot really look in silos, that we cannot really look at how air pollution uh, affects the health of urban dwellers, for instance, um, or noise. But uh, these are all exposures that come from the way that we have basically organized, uh, both in a physical sense, but then also in a social sense, our cities and our living environments. And to be really effective in those interventions, we really have to know these different drivers and how they actually interconnect with each other. Um, and what actually are their relationships to the urban form that we actually have created. Because if we actually wanna have sustainable um, solutions to the burden of disease that we actually observe, we actually have to understand these more upstream uh, factors that we actually can change. In that system approach, we also have to think that it's not only health and perhaps we have to have a planetary health perspective on it, that it's not the human health, but it's also the health of the ecosystems and natural systems that the health of humans depends on. And with that, I mean that it actually links to climate change, it links to energy transition, it links to many of the important transitions that we have in Europe. Now, um, I've been leading in the last 16 months, basically the European Exposome um, Human Network, um, a hundred million research program funded under the last program, um, which really takes a system approach to actually develop novel tools to actually map the chemical exposures, to map the social exposures of um, the European citizens um, and basically also the physical environments. And by actually building up this complex system of the European population, we actually can start looking at what are the real drivers of those, 
but not only basically what are those drivers, but also really focus on um, inequalities, because we know that the environmental burden of disease is not equal across Europe, and that in certain populations and certain segments of the populations, these risk factors actually um, tend to compound, and that actually leads to the fact that um, it's not equal across Europe, and that we actually have to focus on actually starting to alleviate basically where it's most needed. So with that, that was basically my, my first thing that I, I wanted to, to raise, um, and, and I can um, go much more in detail about what I think are the eight most important uh, topics that I think need to be addressed, uh, and that comes from the HERA project, which basically has been mapping the last two years the environmental um, 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 the, the, uh, the, the, what we actually, the environmental program, research program for, for Europe, and, and really thinking about what are now actually the things that we need to do infrastructurally, research-wise, and in a transformative sense. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn now, uh, Dr. Sanaya Netanyahu. You're coming from the World Health Organization, and as well there very directly identified, the reason we are talking about pollution is because of the impact it has on us as humans. So give me a broad idea what you think needs to maybe change in our way of thinking or what sort of steps do we need to look at concretely and broadly uh, in the coming years but before we get into the details of, of what might happen in terms of practice in Europe. Thank you, Jennifer. And I think that um, uh, well, actually already covered many of the things is, I mean, basically we have to start with going uh, um, we must be going uh, beyond the traditional silos. This is probably number one uh, recommendation. Uh, I think that uh, recent pandemic has shown to us that uh, we must put together human, animals, and ecological health together to take the approach of one, one health and to look into that. I mean, we could see the interconnectivity, the interconnection, the complexity of systems. It's not that we didn't know that before, but we need to expose that further. We need to identify it further. We need to research that further. And uh, we cannot, we cannot, I'm not saying that we, we are hiding behind silos, but we cannot be, we don't have the time uh, just to stay in silos. Obviously we have to be, develop expertise in each field, um, and uh, but, but beyond that, we have to be able to reach out and work with uh, partners from other sectors, other uh, disciplines, and to develop um, to develop uh, more um, uh, research that uh, will be um, realistic in, in, in also the time frame that we are setting, because there are lots of goals to be achieved according to the zero pollution by 2030. And this is really a short time. I mean, we're talking not about a long-term research. This is something that we need to put on the table. You are talking about, you're asking about what, how we can further accelerate relevant research. I mean, this is already an accelerated mode because if we want to achieve uh, results, that means that there should be um, research, there should be some policy to, that research and science be translated to policy. There should be some action. There should be budget along. It should be agreement, consent. I mean, there should be political uh, agreement uh, uh, and among different stakeholders. And there should be also the finance. So I will maybe have a chance to talk about it a little bit better because I do believe that we have to explore that. I mean, the connection between the scientific world and, and health and the economic burden on our societies because not acting also costs money. We have to take the king to account. And um, we've seen recently um, a very nice work being done by the Descupta report on the topics of biodiversity and economics, and where um, it exposed the value of uh, biodiversity. <clears throat> and also he is addressing a bit of uh, the, the impact of, on health. This has to be done on every single thing, because also at the end of the day, um, the, we, are, we are trying to, to reach a certain goals, and the goals are very, very, very ambitious. This, the goals that have been set in the zero pollution uh, um, um, document is, are very, very ambitious. For example, in air pollution, we want to reduce 55% of, 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 uh, of uh, that. Uh, this is a very ambitious because as of now, one in eight uh, person um, um, uh, or one in eight uh, one in eight, I'm sorry, deaths in the EU is related to environmental pollution. This is a lot. I mean, we, behind that, there are lots of issues related to air pollution, chemicals, soil. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about contaminated soil, the rehabilitation of that. We, if we are also 
uh, on going into a transit uh, or, tr or going into transformation from giving up or actually um, giving some of the industries, the polluting industries, polluting behaviors behind, then also we need to do something about the commissioning of those activities. How do we go about it? We cannot leave um, many sites polluted, many commercial sites, industrialized sites, contaminated soil, contaminated rivers. We need to take a good action. And, and some, sometimes we also tend to leave that behind. We are looking at you know, at, at other things and, and, and we need to make sure that we also include that in our, um, you know, accelerated research, innovation and implementation of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I may, I'm, I'm quite struck by what you're saying about the polluting behaviours and, and I think maybe we will talk a little bit about what research is maybe needed into whole change, chains of action and how they're interconnected. Annalisa, uh, let me turn to you. Um, the urban environment has faces particular challenges. Um, give me your perspective. I mean, I'm sure you agree broadly with what you're hearing from your colleagues, but where do you see uh, your note of difference, if you like? Yeah, thank you, uh, first of all, to the European Commission for every, having thought of, uh, of, uh, of me and of, uh, of Eurocities and having invited, uh, invited us to, to speak here Compliment, in a complementary way to what has been said. So, of course, I, uh, I'm going to speak on, you know, on behalf of uh, of the cities of, of many European cities, as we represent around 200, um, you know, 150 of them are quite big. And so I would say that to to make it happen, to really fight pollution, a lot depends on EU legislation and if and how it is actually uh, implemented. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, from the point of view of cities, that's fundamental because they get delegated to do so uh, very much at the at the local level and so it's really about uh, achieving the action plan targets for instance if you look at them will rely on the ability of cities and regions to uh, implement them yeah and to to be able to therefore to to have um, an impact and that means for instance having more information on any specific measures to manage, um, you know, the, the goals such I don't know, just as an example, a 50% reduction in, you know, residual municipal waste. So that's very important to get that information. So what I want to say is that cities are the front, forefront of the of the implementation of pollution relevant laws, policies, and programs, and so we need to support them in this respect. Many cities, of course, are taking increased action already, and so on, but still. The, the, the challenges are many still, many cities are struggling to address pollution sufficiently. I'm thinking of EU air quality standards that are still breached in more than 100 cities in the EU. Rivers, lakes, coastal waters are under significant pressure. Noise pollution is really going up in a huge way. Uh, rising production and consumption partners have led to an increase in municipal solid waste generation, if you think of textile and all this. And there is, this, and there is still a strong dependency on uh, pesticide. And so the main challenges maybe to take effective action and bridge the existing implementation gaps today, we've, we've done a, a research through a survey and a research through the, um, you know, the Green City Accord initiative which is a very interesting initiative in this respect um, that really tries to mobilize cities to, um, to um, you know, achieve uh, targets on uh, the different areas that the action plan is actually uh, covering as well. Uh, among those challenges, you know, there are insufficient or outdated information and knowledge on the causes of environmental degradation and the related, uh, you know, the impacts of these of these uh, causes, uh, lack of comp of a complete overview of the range of solutions that exist already uh, to respond to the challenges, lack of qualified experts. I mean, having real expertise is an important element, or insufficient information about efficient solutions, as I said, sectoral divisions. And there, I'm I'm moving towards what has already been said by by the previous speakers, uh, really about limited financial resources or uh, engagement of citizens and all the stakeholders. And above all, I would say, you know, um, gaps, uh, you know, not gap, yeah, gaps in terms of multi-level, proper multi-level governance with, 
misalignment as well between policies and legislations, and above all, this uh, you know silos uh, issues. This in how do you say is the biggest challenge of all. I would say this uh, the challenge of thinking and implementing and even conceiving. I would say in a holistic way, in a integrated way, both in terms of you know the transformation, but also the the planning and the approach to the actual policies and projects it's a it's a real it's a real you know headache and a, a real issue at all levels and of course that's why um i bring in you know the, my experience in the board on the you know climate neutral and smart cities uh, mission uh, is interesting because exactly by working on a mission uh, of that type uh, that we have conceived is really about uh, supporting cities to to transform themselves in a systemic way towards climate neutrality and therefore really try to innovate uh, at all levels in all the in all the relevant dimensions from you know the the issue of working together in uh, having sectors working together but also in the governance in the way you know uh, you know, it, it's possible to work with the, the ecosystem, the local ecosystem and citizens and so on. So, yeah, I think it's, we can, we can go deeper later if you want, but I would, I would, uh, yeah, complement the other speakers in this, in this way. Stay with me, Anaisa, because I'm going to ask a follow up question to you. I want to get on to this question of research, because as you mentioned, sometimes we have incomplete data or outmoded information with which to make the decisions that we want to drive change. So I want to know what is the role for cities in terms of research? Because we often think of research as very much a, a pan-European question or a national uh, competency. And um, but, you know, we also at the same time see hubs springing up. So can you tell me a bit more about the role of cities when it comes to pushing research or fostering research in particular areas? Well, first of all, we've seen, uh, if I think, oh, okay, it's it's different levels. I mean, we have research at the local level or national level and research in terms of, for instance, Horizon Europe, which is still another, another story. But already you can see, we can see trends of, uh, you know, it's it's becoming evident that there is a strong need to have research inform policy choices and also like uh, urban challenges identified by, for instance, uh, you know, local authorities to inform research agendas. That becomes really, really uh, uh, a sort of urgency because otherwise it's, uh, you, you end up with policy that is uh, not sufficiently you know, research led and evidence led uh, and so on. And on the other side, you have research that then stays in its own uh, satellites and it's in its own world and doesn't manage to have an impact in actual policies, which are the things that can really make the difference in the end for people. So I think that if you, so in terms of, uh, for instance, the local level, there are attempts to create, for instance, research officers within administrations to really create or science officers, uh, Amsterdam as an example, but there are other cities more and more that really tries to make this connection to really bring the two worlds uh, together and in this respect i think it will be very interesting to do this exercise applied to the recovery uh, investments because it will be super interesting to understand what investments are needed and how you know what is behind those uh, and so on so and how they can also become um, uh, how to say how they can be systematized into policies in the long run so that's that's more the local level at, at the european level i would say that already horizon uh, 2020 has made some uh, leaps uh, forward compared to the previous ones there are more let's say that there is uh, there is more listening to what are the needs uh, or what are the urban challenges that needs to be tackled by research, uh, EU research, and that's already has provided some ideas. I don't know, I'm thinking of emerging issues like uh, food and things like that, that Horizon 2020 has managed to, 
to um, you know mention that that's not in the pollution, but still it's connected if you think. Um, but also other other aspects. Um, so that that's important. And so it it so it's really important that the research at the European level uses cities as, for instance, first of all as uh, boards to provide um, the the you know the themes, the urban challenges, what where there is a need to go further and on, where there is a need for research, um, we can go into the details of where there is need. And on the other side, it's also to you, to you, to have more programs where you can actually work with cities and test um, uh, things with them, on them. That I think that there haven't been enough till now. Thank you for that. Um, very clearly points made, and I'm sure the others will be able to reflect on them. But well, you promised us eight topics. <laughs> Perhaps you can uh, you can group them, but but tell us where you see the the uh, these uh, issues that have arisen, as you said, I think from the from the Hera project. Right. I, I would like to to talk about the Hera project, but um, perhaps it's good to to reflect also on on the previous, uh, if I if I may, because um, I I think there there from a scientific point of view, there there are things clearly that we have to do at a pan-European level um, just to basically build our knowledge. Um, and for instance, we do that within the large expense project, which is part of this um, European Human Exposome Network, where you know if you want to answer new questions about air pollution or noise and, and so on, uh, or new chemicals that, that come up, uh, you need large studies and, and you need to do that basically in a pan-European uh, way to, to um, get that knowledge. However, um, I think we often forget that in the end we basically have to implement that knowledge into change and into interventions. And this is exactly where I think um, cities are hugely important because the, the rate of change and the possibility and actionability of cities is actually quite large. Um, they are the ones that create new neighborhoods. They are doing planning. And I think as researchers, we, we have not been really um, been well connected to, to these changes. And so what I've done in, in my institute and my projects is that we are really embedded into the city plannings and, and basically try to translate our knowledge that we have to see basically if we start to tweak that, does it actually generate um, the gain that we think it would generate or are there secondary effects or are humans actually exhibiting other behavior that we actually would think they, they would do um, based on our uh, current knowledge and that updates our knowledge. But what is so important and I think your cities has an important role to play there is that we have to create a learning community um, because we often see that uh, in, basically interventions or experimentation is done at a local level, but it ends after one or two years because funding runs out or because of local circumstances. And that lesson that is learned there often does not get translated to another city or another neighborhood. And so what we really have to do within the new program as well, and I think outside the research program, but it is in a in natural, we have to meet each other much more so that we can actually do this learning cycle much faster um, than what we are doing now. And so that what we learn in Paris can be applied in Amsterdam or it can be applied in Lyon or somewhere else in Europe. Um, that doesn't happen now. And, and that actually makes this rate of change, this transformative change that we want, uh, that, that hampers that. And I think if we really want to get this ambition of the Green Deal, that we actually want to have this change in a very short time, then we actually have to make that knowledge basically available to everybody. And that, so that's really um, my ploy. And, I, and uh, you probably want to go to another question. I can take the, the HERA question uh, later, but I, I think this is for me one of the more important points. Um, and let's not forget the European citizens in this as well, because in the end to have science being accepted, knowledge being accepted, and to have sustainability of the interventions, um, we have to do that in co-creation. We have to basically do that in co-design so that it doesn't necessarily is a top-down effort. And so that's the other point that I, I think I wanted to, to really bring forward in, in this discussion. And do you think that the Horizon Europe is the right instrument? Is it set at the right pace? Is it set at the right level? I mean, that's, that's an interesting um, question. And I, I would argue that um, 
it not always works um, because if I just think from the research projects that I'm involved in, they often have a, a four to five year time frame. And to be able to actually do um, implementation research, to do interventions and be able to evaluate basically what happens, you have to have basically a zero measurement before it happens. You have to basically um, observe what is actually implemented and then basically be able to evaluate what, what is the outcome of that. And, and of course, you can already uh, kind of suspect that that is not necessarily a four year time frame to actually be able to, to do that. And so I think we have to potentially think more about partnerships, which of course in a new program is possible and a partnership about urban health would be great to have so that you actually have a much longer time frame to actually go through this learning cycle a few times um, and be really able to actually make significant progress. So um, I would argue that we, we sometimes have to also look a little bit longer than the normal four to five year kind of partnerships. Well, Sunia, same question to you then, um, regarding and perhaps build on your thoughts on this question of uh, time frames, but also the, the instrument of Horizon Europe as well. You spoke about concerns over longer term funding or, or projects where, where funding and financing ran out. Um, how does that tie into your view of the current instruments? Okay, um, well, there are two, two items that I really want to touch and you'll also hopefully answer uh, your questions. Um, one is how, how, how to do that, how to also, and going back to the first question, how to accelerate the, the research, but also the innovation and implementation, because this is really important. So one thing is that if we can attach to the research another component um, of, of implementation and what I, in, in cities, and what I, what, I, what I mean by that is cities are just an excellent beta site. I mean, this is a place where you can take your research results and try to implement, even if it's, you know, it's a technology or idea or digital and health and biodiversity or digital and health and air pollution, doesn't matter if it's monitoring or if it has to do with reporting or prevention or remedy or, or any of all those things that are being described in the zero pollution. But how can we um, turn the cities into a real, real data site, into a real living laboratory where can we try, I mean, with all the reservations and the careful um, approach into that and, and obviously, but how can you, we do pilots, more pilots uh, and hands on and not just leaving the research uh, as, as a document, as a paper, but also try to get back to the cities and, and also uh, to work with the cities. The other thing that uh, I would say regarding uh, cities, I mean, we have this tendency to look at um, at research that is related, for example, on our side, on the health impact assessment, etc., to look at the, at, at, at the negative parts, like how is air pollution affecting health, how is uh, noise affecting health, how is uh, uh, contamination uh, of, of soil, uh, how heat waves are affecting health. But we should also, I think, we'll bring to policymakers the more and more information about how to build the positive features. I mean, what can we gain from blue space within the city? What can we gain health, health uh, in terms of health um, from green spaces? Uh, what can we gain from biodiversity, from urban uh, in nature, etc.? There are lots of amenities, there are lots of advantages and benefits to that uh, from physical health and to, to mental health that need to account for. So we need also to work on that, uh, on that side as well. well. Let me expand a little bit more um, on, on a question to all of you. And I don't want to get too labored into the point of the current pandemic, because I think people are probably suffering a, quite a bit of pandemic fatigue at the moment. But has there been a shift in, in, in thinking around what the linkage is between pollution and health? And are there any golden or sort of silver linings that we can take any golden rules that we can maybe take away from the current crisis? We have seen, if we did stay on the topic of funding, that there are these recovery funds being put forward that are tied to specific things like digitization or like the Green Deal. What would be your advice uh, coming out of this current period in terms of what we could take from it to accelerate the aims that we all have agreed that we share? Um, Annalisa, let me start with you. I mean, feel free to reflect on how we got to where we are as well. Yeah, um, well, first I would say again, uh, from the perspective of our 
our constituents, our community. I think one thing we must uh, really try and do is to keep the, the sort of window of opportunity open, as open as possible, to, to make it actually a real and a unique opportunity, because it is. I mean, it's a it's a moment where, yeah, it's a it's a sort of combination of policy, uh, policy framework like the Green Deal, yeah, and the, the sort of you know push that this Commission has given to to the entire you know to the to the EU, but also to all those that are part of the of the EU and therefore cities as well. And on the other side, the sort of, you know, recovery money and the next generation as a whole, so the MFF. And so if you combine these two, it's really like unique. So I have to say that the a lot of the mayors that we, we work with have understood that. And they, you know, they, they are trying to recover from, they've been hit so much. I mean, cities have been hit so much, uh, you know, during the pandemic in terms of, you know, tourism, jobs, um, you know, a lot, mobility, everything, social, I mean, the rising, already, the, the, I mean, there were many, many challenges before, but of course, the pandemic has not only x-rayed them, but also, um, you know, aggravated them. So it's really, really, and also in cities, you have the biggest part of the population. So it's, it's really a big impact. So I can see that the the mayors that I work with are really in a, in a sort of posture to really take this opportunity, and that's why we've we've uh, not only launched a, an alliance, mayors alliance for the Green Deal in this respect. So to really show and demonstrate what cities have been doing, uh, taking advantage of, for instance, the fact that the pandemic made obliged people to to do certain things that had uh, positive impacts uh, on health in this respect so you know smart working whatever um, bike lanes uh, your noise less noise but so that that you know we have a, a new alliance that will demonstrate this you know this amount of uh, actions this this uh, really effort strong effort uh, so that's uh, that's that's clear, but it's also we we've, we 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 are also trying to work with the Commission and the member states to make them understand that it's important to uh, to have those cities in the governance of the national plans, because if they're not part of that, it will be difficult to really make the most of those investments and really um, have an impact. Um, you know, on the on the you know on those areas in terms of really green transformations and uh, systemic transformations. So I think so. Keep the momentum. Help them to push because they are good allies and they I think good allies of the EU a bit even better than uh, than some national uh, you know governments who are a bit more reticent or you know complacent. So I think that's that's a, a really important uh, thing to do in terms of the pandemic, I would say. But and also try and uh, fight this temptation to go back to normal, basically. While it's the opposite, we need to really build a new normal. I don't like the thing build back better because there's this back that I don't like. <laughs> so it's really like build better, full stop, and uh, transform and move forward. If we don't do it now, we don't, when shall we do it? Yeah. Good question, thank you. Never waste uh, you know, a good crisis, as somebody said. I 100% agree. Um, Sunia, I want you to, the same question to you. Um, Annalisa sort of gave some really practical examples of, of changes we've seen over the last year and a, and a bit. Um, but do you think there's been any sort of critical shift in thinking or understanding about the links between pollution and health. And, you know, I'm thinking in terms of, for example, degradation of, of, of wild landscapes and, and uh, you know, the impact of cities on rural areas and encroachment and so on. But also I want to think about even questions around biodiversity and, and the knock on effects for the whole chain that ultimately has detrimental effects on human life. Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, I, obviously this pandemic uh, is, is um, it's registered somewhere, right? I mean, uh, 
obviously people are reacting. Um, I want to start with uh, actually um, uh, uh, mentioning the manifesto, the WHO manifesto that it was being written uh, back in May 2020 uh, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and, and it was really, really interesting with, um, you know, WHO coming with a list of prescriptions for healthy and green recovery. And it was really, really interesting. The WHO is saying that number one prescription it would be to protect and preserve the source of human health, which is nature. So obviously nature by and large, I mean, um, you know, we can think about biodiversity, we can think about the global effort, the regional effort, the national effort, and also the local effort. But definitely nature is something that we do need to take a, a close look. Uh, we are uh, taking usually, I mean, many times uh, for granted uh, that if the city needs to expand then it will go and uh, uh, expand on the account of uh, open space or, or agricultural land and, and cities are growing and population are, are, are you know, we have more and more population. And the question how we keep this balance, uh, on the other hand, we do see a huge uh, extinction of species all around the world and also in Europe. Europe is not immune. Um, there are certain areas in Europe that are losing a lot of their biodiversity. And um, I think that uh, research must, uh, must be trans translated again for policy to policy and, um, and to also to a simple language and to, so people can understand how nature is really related to health, how nature is related to our economy, how nature is related to our food systems, etc. I want to mention also uh, other prescriptions that were written in the, this manifesto that they are all really connected to the to the recovery. And and and, and like uh, Anna, Anna, I don't like the the building uh, back better. It's really building building forward better. So I want to say two things. One about the other prescription in the manifesto, and the other thing is um, um, that that I want to say is that we are not just building forward better just because of the um, of the um, of the COVID. But I want to also to put it in a greater context. So first of all, with the manifesto. So besides the First prescription that has to do with net, nature, we also talk about the water and, and, and clean energy. We also talk about the, the energy transition that must be taken into account because this also has a huge health effect. All, all the items that I'm mentioning has a huge health effect on the population. Also to promote healthy and sustainable food systems, also to build healthy cities or livelihood, livable cities. And the last one is not presumably not health related. The, the sixth pres prescription talks about stop using taxpayer money to fund pollution. This is something that we need to stop before we are funding projects, we need to stop subsidizing polluting projects. That's very, very important. This is probably number one if we want to do that. Regarding the building forward better, recently I think UNEP has uh, released, uh, I think in March, uh, a document uh, looking at the, the amount of money that was invested in green recovery, it was very, very low. It was almost negligible. So the, the question must be asked, where is this money going? I mean, we are recovering, but we are not putting money for green recovery. But when we're recovering, I want to say that we are not just recovering from the pandemic. I think that cities and countries are in the middle of a long recovery. I mean, one, one, in one aspect is that in 2015, we are having the Sustainable Development Goals, right? The Agenda 2030. So this is also cities and countries are adapting to that. In addition, we have the Paris Agreement that also gave a boost to many cities, many countries also to build better. So it's not just the pandemic. We are having a series of continuous topics since Rio 1992, but more recently from 2015, the Paris Agreement, um, and 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 also the at the same at the same year we having the we are having this SDGs and also we are having also this um, uh, talk about how to recover from generally from disasters uh, that is being um, um, the, 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 there are also uh, some some international agreements have been discussed has been written around that so there is a push in recent years to recover and to do things differently. Um, the pandemic is really right. It's the most recent one and the most accelerated, probably, um, um, event 
because it, hap it happens not like climate change over all the many, many years. It happens in a few weeks, days, months. So this is accelerating. But uh, uh, there will be no, no, um, no way around. I mean, we do need to look into planetary health, into one health concept. So not just concept, there's a lot of research, a lot of ideas behind them, and we do need to look at that. And I think that uh, uh, mayors and, and policymakers and politicians as well, I mean, they need to get up in the morning and ask, you know, not just about job, but how can I provide my citizen in my city healthy life, less diseases, less uh, illnesses? Uh, I mean, this is something that we need to ask uh, all the time. I think you're right. I think obviously when something happens so fast, it provides a shock and a public shock. Policies tend to follow when, when we see these headlines that people are really crying out for something immediate to happen. Uh, in some ways, it's it's a shame that you don't see climate change happening on such a rapid scale as to provoke the headlines because we all get a little complacent or certainly policymakers can get a little bit complacent. But we'll, we did at the same time as coming out and see this huge, amazing push for the vaccine recovery. We saw huge amount of resources and funding when there is a crisis directed at that. I mean, do you think that there's any hope that such uh, impetus could be redirected um, for the future? Or are you scared that there will be some sort of slide back in terms of funding research and innovation? You're on, uh, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, that's quite difficult to, um, to, to answer. Um, I think I just want to take a little bit of a different approach to that. Um, I think what we, we see now is basically um, youth funding coming back for, for vaccines, for basically looking at the, the impact that the pandemic has had directly, um, but also indirectly. Um, let's not forget that about um, basically um, all the lockdowns, what that has done basically to physical activity, to actually delayed screening of diseases and so on. Um, so there, there are many health impacts that, that we are confronted with. Um, what, I, what, what I think we have to take as a learning lesson is that I, um, it was actually quite difficult to, to get the information um, on the table, to actually be able to uh, very quickly respond uh, from a research standpoint to what is going on, um, what are really the risk factors that are in play, uh, what makes people um, basically more susceptible to um, infections, um, what determines basically um, the outcome of, um, the, uh, for, of an infection. And I think um, one of the lessons that I, I hope we will get is that we have to invest much more into the infrastructure of health data um, on environmental data in, in Europe. Yeah, so that, that actually uh, allows us to do much more quicker linkages to be able to react to new situations. With that, I mean that um, the effort to get our, all our data and knowledge uh, fair, which stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, um, needs to get a, a huge imp uh, input um, because um, we have seen that we weren't able to react quickly enough in the last pandemic, um, and we are not really prepared to to address many of these these, these things. I think if on the lessons of, of what we have learned, um, and I, I don't like to call it silver linings, but I think there are lessons that we have learned about our living environment. I think we have personally seen how important it is our social environments, right? We're back to our neighborhoods and social cohesion. Um, being able to rely on your uh, neighborhood um, became incredibly important, and we had forgotten that. Um, we have also seen that um, certain changes that happened by working at home um, certainly was able, and we actually changed our mobility patterns considerably, um, leading to um, a decrease in air pollution levels. And so we, we, we see that we actually can change uh, under these circumstances. Uh, but I also think it's important that we have learned that, you know, if we think about the emergence of the pandemic, that indeed um, the deforestation, biodiversity loss, uh, infringement of basically uh, or the, the pressure between urbanization and, and rural is, is really important. But then we think about basically the health impact. 
um, really the underlying health of the population turned out to be hugely important. Um, if you look at basically cardiovascular disease, lung disease, metabolic disease, which basically are the risk factors for worse outcome of COVID-19 disease, many of those actually are environmentally driven, again, related to how we actually build our cities, how we organize our social environments. Um, so again, I think what we realize here is that our living environments um, from a mental health standpoint, from the chronic disease standpoint, are hugely important. And I think that's what I hope that the lessons are um, so that we increase the research, but also the infrastructure to be able to actually get the learnings and the data to come to these insights. Well, I want to ask about, if you like, the different sorts of policies. And Sinea, I'd like your thoughts on this as well. I wonder if there is a intrinsic dis difference between policies that seek to reduce damage that's already been done. You mentioned disaster recovery, recovering from the pandemic, reducing pollution that's already there. And then the sorts of policies that we see to protect, protect environments that haven't yet been damaged, if you like, you know, sort of birds and habitats directive, pollinators initiative, although of course some of that is trying to roll back damage that has been done. But do you see that they work together well enough at the moment? Do you feel that you talked about silos earlier on. Is this an area where there are silos in terms of research? Uh, there, there, there are enormous silos in research, um, I, I would say, and, 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 and I think things are coming more together. But traditionally, um, these fields have been very separate. Um, I think what, what, what we see now is um, what I call this kind of system knowledge. Um, that it is also basically the, the thought behind planetary health, where we realize that you know the, the, the health of humans basically is depending on uh, the natural systems, uh, the health of the natural system that it depends on. And so that, that is already, uh, I think, something that we realize much more than, than we did before. But one of the problems really is, is what I call basically, uh, we lack instruments to, to get this integrated assessments um, because what is optimal for climate change or what is optimal for energy transition may not necessarily be optimal for, for mobility or maybe optimal for, for health. And one of the problems that we see, at least at the local level, if we look at um, uh, policies, is that it's very difficult to, to be able to say, okay, how do I actually turn all the knobs into a certain setting that the end result, which is basically well-being, I would, would argue, um, is basically optimal. Uh, and we actually lack basically this, this kind of um, models and tools to actually be able to, to, to weigh these different options that we have. Uh, and that makes it really difficult. And that's also where I can see basically in cities that, you know, how do you actually weigh mobility uh, policies versus basically uh, health policies, social policies, um, how do you actually, uh, because you're a euro, you can only spend once. And, and so how do you actually weigh all these different factors together? And that's really where we have to come together interdisciplinary, but also uh, basically transdisciplinary, where we actually reach across the science and into basically uh, the policy um, and to really uh, where it happens. And that comes back to full circle to where we started, that that actually happens in cities. And that's where the interaction point is. Well, ladies, I'm going to ask you both to reflect on this point as well. As sort of how do you get more bang for your buck, I suppose is the phrase we might use, in terms of um, whether there's a discrepancy between, if you like, protection policies and prevention policies. Uh, Sinead, can I ask you your, your response to that? Yeah. Yeah, Sinai. Yeah, I want, I want to answer that also by demonstrating an example, um, because there are lots of policies that, you know, that uh, need to, or, or research also that try to, to reduce pollution. There are lots of policy or research that try to look into promoting uh, environmental amenities, etc. Um, but I want to give an example of how this all, the whole things are interact, interact, very interactive and very can be very also uh, confusing. And that's why we need very good science and also very good translation to policy. So if I take, for example, it's, a, it's an example that I like to use, the, the example of West, wastewater. We are treating wastewater, right? We don't want to, um, uh, to charge them into oceans or rivers polluted, in a polluted way, so we're treating them. But treating them costs cost money, and we need to somehow to recover that cost. 
But when we're doing that, in some places, you're using this wastewater, treated wastewater, for irrigation. You sell, you sell the water again to farmers. It, it's happening in certain countries, and it's a growing solution. And it will be growing solution. And the reason why it's going to be growing solution, because of climate change and because of water scarcity. So it's a legitimate thing, okay? But the thing is, research shows us that while you're trying to solve one thing, okay, to reduce pollution and to promote food production, agriculture, to solve issues related to water scarcity, what's really happening, if we're not watching very carefully the level of treatment of the wastewater, we are going to treat it to a second or tertiary, secondary or tertiary level, where what's happening at that point is that contaminants of emerging concerns are going to remain within the treated, treated wastewater. And this treated wastewater goes for, um, to, to our, uh, for irrigation. And then we can find some residuals of those contaminants in the food, in the soil, and in the groundwater or water bodies next to, this, to those areas. So here is, here is a solution, here is a problem, here is an opportunity, and we like to call it circular economy, okay? Here we are recycling the water and, and finding a, pro, a solution for circular economy. And also I was trying to show in this example that there are also limits to circular economy. We also need to assess uh, if until uh, assess the health impact, if until now we assess the impact, the health impact on, in our linear economy, okay? that we use and we throw and all that. And now we need to reassess the impact and the economic and the feasibility and the technicality of things within the circular economy. So there are lots of things, lots of details to look into that. Thanks. Thank you. Annalisa, I think you had a point you were going to make on replication question. What, what were you going to add there? You're on mute. This is quite terrible. We all fall into this. <laughs> so the, the issue of replication, basically, it's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. And I have to say that um, in the in the horizon uh, 2020, we haven't managed to make it work. I, I must be honest, because also the understanding of replication is, you know, varies and is different. Uh, so the, the projects where uh, replication has been part of the, you know, actions, um, they had a little bit of money for like a sort of so-called followers uh, cities uh, to be mentored and to, you know, apply uh, what the other, let's say, the, high, the smart, the, the lighthouses uh, you know, uh, experimented and tested, but there was no, yeah, without money, you can't do anything. So the projects themselves were not geared to maximize that possibility of, of replication. And so going back to what uh, Professor Vermeulen was saying at the beginning, that's necessary. The sort of learning is necessary. And, and you know, the, the, the lighthouse on one side, they don't have the incentive to mentor the followers and the followers don't have the money <laughs> to, to uh, basically follow that. So I think that in terms of the learning, um, you know, create, uh, maybe create less hierarchical project structures that do that or have more pilots, as Sine was saying, um, not, not having followers and, uh, you know, lighthouses and followers, this creates already a sort of hierarchical um, relation it doesn't it doesn't really advocate for peer learning in, in peers and so on so i think there could be a lot of innovation and uh and uh better better impact in terms of uh, learning and um co you know coaching mentoring and um you know replication there we on in the digital part we're trying to push for a um a real sort of movement but more on the digital uh, world, uh, part of the Green Deal. So we call it living in dot in dot the EU, and that's a that's a movement where we really try to put together member states, cities, and so on, and, and networks and so on, to really make the most of the good uh, solutions that exist. For instance, in cities that are developed, and try really to work on replication there. But of course, it means investing, putting you know putting a lot of money into into that as well but it's a for me it's a fundamental element that should be part of horizon 
surprise me. Well, this morning uh, during the Life Awards, I asked our audience what particular steps they were taking themselves to try and combat climate change and not specifically pollution. But in general, I was very struck that many of the responses centered around mobility. So people saying that they would walk or take a bike rather than travel by car. And the other area that seemed to really crop up was a, was a huge proportion of people saying that they would buy local or that they would eat only organic or that they would reduce their meat consumption. And what struck me is that these two areas, whilst being ostensibly answering the question, what are you doing to tackle climate change, also can in many cases have a beneficial knock on health impact. And I'm wondering, are policymakers joining the dots between these things and working out ways in which, you know, uh, you can get people to react in a way that feels altruistic and to the benefit of society, who mentioned earlier, if you like the social requirements that came about because of the pandemic, but in a way that also gradually overall raises the public health question as well and raises the, the level of healthiness, if you like, in our cities and in our societies. I wonder, do any of you have any particular thoughts that you would draw from that um, sort of very unscientific poll that we did this morning? Sunia, a few thoughts on this? Yeah, I will take the, the example of uh, mobility and, and specifically the micro mobility. And uh, we are just developing now a project on that in our center in Bonn, where we want to look at, uh, at uh, the impact of the, um, the e mobility, the electric, uh, the electric, um, uh, electric mo uh, micro mobility as in the cities. Obviously, the obvious thing is that it would reduce pollution, it would reduce greenhouse emissions as, as a result of not using. Uh, um, uh, other transportation, uh, polluting transportation, it will increase physical activity, it will, um, um, it, it has many, many positive, uh, positive elements, obviously, we need to take care of injuries and things like this. But when we, I mean, but we cannot only look obviously only at the positive things, if we are looking in the life cycle assessment of those vehicles, we need to look into their time span and the, the lifespan of those vehicles of those so because they um, they are being, um, um, you know, they have very short, usually three months to two or three years lifespan, and especially if those are shared micro mobility uh, vehicles. Uh, but also, there's another component. We are always pushing now for the e mobility, right? Or the e micro mobility. But there is, I mean, we could not neglect again, there are batteries there. There are also rare elements or, or metals that we need to import from a, from a from outside Europe and most of the time. We need to recycle. Uh, we need to take care of, of all those uh, of this waste or recycle them or to bring it back to the to our economies. So nothing is really no, no solution is free of environmental consequences as in the result health consequences. Um, we, we need to we need to look at the whole at the whole really well-rounded way on, on each solution that we are checking. Also this by local I mean still we need to make sure that we don't introduce many chemicals, etc. There are also lots of issues related to that. Thank you very much. Now it's our last two minutes. So I'm just going to ask very, very briefly in, in, in 10 seconds or a few words, if you had one wish each for the new Horizon Europe, if you could, what would be your one word, one wish for Horizon Europe going forward? Annalisa, please. I don't want to repeat myself, but I think, uh... Yeah, work with cities to understand, to go deeper into the sort of needs, to go much more focused into that and use them as test beds. Uh, but also uh, there's a lot of needs in terms of, you know, uh, helping cities to, to work in a systemic way and in a different way with the citizens. Because as you said, change, there's a lot, there's, there's really a strong need to, to research behaviors, uh, you know all this part that you know it nearly into a in a in an anthropological <laughs> way as well because without judgment you know and it's really about trying to, to understand that and being able to to address it and on the other side the citizens empowerment but you know research on what does it mean in power sharing what does you know what's all that I mean it's it's a lot of implications and but these are the real I believe game changers it's not only your in infrastructure or you know okay. redoing buildings and stuff it's, it's really also about people 
That's a big wish and very complex. Well, can you narrow it down even further? Only in the interest of time. Uh, uh, yeah, for the interest of time. Uh, but I, 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 I promise to basically give you the six points of the ERA report. So I'm just going to read them out very quickly, um, one by one. Um, first, I think the Horizon program should focus on uh, to reduce the effects of climate change and ecological degradation on health. We talked about this in regard to the pandemic. Uh, eliminate environmental exposures harmful to health. We still have to think about the very complex chemical world that we in, live in, uh, and we actually need to, to think about that very clearly. Um, promote health, uh, healthy lives in sustainable and inclusive societies. Um, I think we have to really focus on inequality in health, and, and, and this is really important. These are basically research gaps. Let's think about um, basically the um, what we also need, and that is improve health impact assessments for environmental factors and promote intervention research, where I talked about implementation, implementation research, really necessary. We need to develop the infrastructures and new technologies for understanding environmental impacts on health. Um, that is new technologies to actually understand it, also behavior, uh, but really also get the infrastructures there so that we actually can be prepared for um, certain things that actually come our way. In the end, we basically have to support transform, uh, transformational change approaches in environmental and health. And this really means that we have to think about different ways how to work together between research, cities, policymakers, citizens to actually get transformation going, because that actually has been lacking. Well done. And you, you, you battled through that very quickly, which means, unfortunately, now you've got maybe three seconds because we are three seconds uh, so there's two words behavioral change don't forget to invest in behavioral change because it's uh it's it's going to be a huge driver thank you so much it's been a really interesting conversation for me I've absolutely... noise pollution don't forget noise pollution <laughs> <laughs> all of the above we we could have spoken for another half an hour or two yeah, hours yeah, true. thank, you, thank you a lot very, very much for today's intervention and let me just keep telling our audience Keep sharing this on social media. Keep using the hashtag EU Green Week 21.